certainly, I think from today's uh, panel discussion, I'm going to talk from the point of view of having first-hand experience of uh, a new type of conflict, which is, uh, as I think many of you know, a, a hybrid conf conflict. Uh, and I I'm talking on behalf of uh, business uh, today, uh, as my role is, is a director of international investor relations for System Capital Management Group, which is Ukraine's largest financial and industrial group. And in fact, I think my contribution, I hope, will be you know, talking a little bit about non-traditional actors, because business is not often seen as an actor uh, in peace and conflict resolution, but I think it has a role to play, and I'm going to probably talk about the role that we, we do play. Uh, because I believe that from uh, in the conflict in Ukraine, our, our business has acted as both uh, an economic actor and as uh, a humanitarian actor, uh, which I'm about to explain. I mean, we are the biggest business group in Ukraine. Before the conflict, we had about 300,000 employees and had a turnover of $24 billion, and we were the mainstay of the economy. Indeed, despite the conflict, we're still the mainstay of the Ukrainian economy. And we've big businesses in metals and mining um, and in energy. And the business is owned by a Ukrainian businessman, uh, Renat uh, Akhmetov, who's, who's my boss. Um, we still remain the biggest employer in Ukraine, but we were headquartered in the city of Donetsk in the east of Ukraine, in the region known as Donbass, which is uh, sadly at the heart of the current conflict. I think uh, on the 25th of May 2014, uh, our, our world uh, changed when the uh, so-called separatist forces took over the city uh, and the conflict in the east of the country uh, began in earnest. And for many people here, I can only say that it's a conflict that appears to have fallen away from the global news schedule uh, as other perhaps more pressing issues uh, have dominated the headlines. But it's, it's a very real conflict for us living and working in Ukraine. Uh, and it impacts on the lives of millions of Ukrainians. Uh, I mean, to date, uh, over 9,500 people have lost their lives. Over 32,000 people have been injured. There are 31 million people, according to UN figures, who've been impacted by the crisis. There are 1.7 million IDPs in Ukraine. And over 800,000 people uh, have uh, fled the country as refugees, many to Russia. So it's the biggest conflict uh, in mainland Europe. Uh, since the Balkans crisis. Now, we're, we're, if you like, had to, we're living through the crisis. Um, when the conflict broke, we already had a foundation, a philanthropic foundation, and that had a hotline, and we started receiving many calls from citizens just saying, you know, look, we need urgent help. We, we, can't, we can't get medicine. Uh, we want to flee the conflict area. Uh, we need assistance with food. We can no longer find foodstuffs, or if we can find them, we can't afford them because of escalating prices and dwindling supply. Uh, and the response from both uh, the owner, Mr. Akhmetov, and the business was to bring together the foundation, our business, and, and our very well-known football club, um, Shakhtar Donetsk, and put together a very immediate crisis response in the form of a humanitarian centre. We launched that in August 2014, so it's been in operation now for, for just over uh, two years. Um, and it has become, in that period, the largest single provider of humanitarian aid uh, in the east of Ukraine, in the conflict zone. And we are able to work, we're one of the few actors who at present are able to work on both sides of uh, the contact line. For those who don't know the conflict, there is a contact line that is essentially a, a de facto a border that separates Ukrainian government-held territory from the territory held uh, by the separatists. Um, to give you an idea of the scale of our operations as a humanitarian actor, trying to prevent uh, a, a humanitarian disaster, we've been able to deliver... Uh, assistance to 1.1 million citizens of Ukraine on both sides of the conflict um, since the conflict began. Uh, we are, we're also been able to, we've, discreetly, we've been able to deliver, of those 1.1 million citizens, we've delivered just over 9 million uh, humanitarian uh, food packs. And we provided them with medical assistance and psychological assistance. And in the heat at the start of the conflict, we helped uh, just under 50,000 people flee the conflict zone and give them the opportunity uh, to get out uh, from, from a very dangerous situation. 
But when we do this, even though we are an actor that's working, coming from business background, we ourselves, both in Ukrainian-held territory and in uh, the separatist-held territory, we're working with other actors. We're working with local NGOs, engaging them, because we need resources that can go into the community uh, and actually reach out and reach citizens in the small towns and villages uh, where the conflict and the problems of the conflict and the humanitarian crisis are at their greatest. Uh, we also work very closely with UN agencies. Uh, um, I have to say we have a very strong partnership with the World Food Programme. Uh, we coordinate strongly with the International Red Cross, and I myself play a key role as a member of the United Nations-led uh, humanitarian country team. And, and I'm very glad that we're able to do that, but it shows the, the difference we see now in the type of responses you get and the actions that organizations like business, if they wish, uh, can do this. Now, just to thinking, pick, picking up on uh, Dr. Deng's point, I think that certainly in, in Ukrainian, Ukrainian case, it was state fragility and poor institutions and uh, yes, sir, endemic corruption <laughs> <laughs> that were uh, that, and a weak democracy at the time that made the conditions possible for conflict to take root. At the time, we had a, a president who uh, I think had lost the path of consensual leadership, had moved into an authoritarian state in terms of decision making, uh, and when he was removed by a, a popular uh, re uh, revolution, um, there was a gap. And the gap was that there was no state security, no state institutions, no state leadership. And in that gap, into that vacuum, moved the separatists and the people who backed them. Um, such a conflict, therefore, in the east of Ukraine couldn't have taken place without weak institutions. They were a primary cause. We can go beyond that and say, what was the cause of weak institutions? But that's probably not for this panel. I think in our role, uh, as both a business and a humanitarian organization, we've tried to help citizens by giving them an immediate humanitarian response, but there's a, a big other part to this. At the same time, from a business perspective, we have businesses and people working for us on both sides of this conflict line. We have actually 50,000 of our employees are in territories under the control of the separatists. And we continue to work in those areas as much as we can. We continue to produce products in those areas. We continue to move products across uh, the contact line that separates the two sides. And just that simple act of ensuring that people are employed and continue to re receive salaries and have hope and money coming in and a job and a purpose uh, is an important aspect of stability in the conflict. And, but what, and why? Because there are so few jobs available in a conflict area, which I think is common in all conflict areas, uh, that the opportunity to have a stable income prevents people moving into other areas. And the only other jobs available presently in a conflict area are often uh, taking up arms and joining the separatist militias. So we view our economic contribution as one of creating stability. But also, as you have trade and flows across the contact line, you also have communication, communication between citizens on both sides of the contact line, working for the same business, our group. You also have to have communication between the government authorities and the de facto separatist authorities to allow those goods to cross the contact line. So in that way, we are keeping the channels open. And I think this is a significant contribution uh, to uh, the long-term peaceful solution. Of course, uh, many people in Ukraine really don't like the idea that we are working on uh, both sides of the contact line uh, and that it can be an unpopular decision for business to take that decision. But very often doing the right thing is not popular. And for us what was more important was doing the right thing. So I think that non-traditional actors such as business it can be a key. I think crucially business plays a, an important role in ensuring that uh, both sides are in contact that we keep economic relations in our business and we keep economic relations between government controlled Ukraine and non-government controlled Ukraine and this builds trust in communications. I think um, through the humanitarian program we are sending strong messages to Ukrainian citizens 
on the side of the contact line uh, under the control of the separatists that Ukraine and Ukrainian citizens and Ukrainian business cares about them, that they're still part of the nation. Uh, and if we can maintain this type of relationship, both through economics and through humanitarian aid, uh, then we are at a point where we, A, have a level of stability, B, we give people hope uh, for the long term, uh, and C, we reduce the possibility of further disengagement. Uh, from, from communication and connection with each other. And hopefully we're building a solid platform that if a peace process can take root and build, uh, that we can build bridges for the future and for the reintegration of the non-government controlled territory back into U Ukraine. And I think that business has a role to play because very often economic relations can be non-political. And they have a shared interest between both parties for those economic relations to continue because they are important aspects of economic stability. Not everybody takes that view, but certainly one that we take, that business is important in that. And I think through that role, business can be an actor in building, in building peace. I think one aspect of all successful outcomes of uh, peace negotiations is that there needs to be the political conditions for peace to exist. And at the moment, there is really no popular support or very little popular support in Ukrainian society uh, for a peaceful solution. And it's very difficult for political actors to impact on the agreements they may have made if there is a lack of overall political will in the country. And I think this is something that CMI is very helpful in doing, is trying to build the capacity inside the country to get a movement inside a nation state towards understanding that peace is in the best interest of all actors. So I think to succeed in a peace negotiation, you need uh, peace to become a political priority for all actors, society, government, and indeed the protagonist to the conflict. And in this area, civil society is absolutely crucial in being the grassroots that builds uh, builds the momentum towards peace and gives politicians um, the license to operate, the license to make coalitions, the license uh, to make difficult and inevitable compromises they will actually need to move peace from discussion um, to implementation. I'm sad to say at the moment we do not see this type of leadership uh, in Ukraine uh, amongst the, the current government. However, I think going forward, what we need are new actors like business, like civil society, building coalitions who support peace, uh, and through doing that, create the space for compromise, uh, and through compromise, conclude the, uh, concluding an agreement. Certainly, there can't be any solution to our conflict in Ukraine, and I think to most conflicts that I've studied during the last two years I've been involved in this, uh, without uh, consensus, compromise, and most of all, leadership. And I think that civil society and politics, and indeed business, uh, are very good places to begin with that.